guys, welcome to our very first ASCA event right here on planetnorth.ca. So my name's Steph, I'm from the Planet North team and I'm very excited to welcome our speakers today. We've got three local experts in drug and addictions who will be chatting with you today and answering all your questions. We've got Jamie from the Alliance Center, Mike from the Alliance Center, and we also have Ashley from HANDS, the Family Health Network. So feel free to ask any questions you want, share your comments, and have some rich discussion around the topic of drug and addictions. Whether you're someone who's experimenting with drugs, um, curious about trying drugs, or if someone close to you is using drugs or might have an addiction, or if you yourself are going through an addiction, um, this is the perfect forum to ask your anonymous questions, get that advice, and find out where to go in the community in order to get some help if that's what you're seeking. Thank you, guys. I, uh, I ended up getting into the addiction field um, because I've been touched by both addiction and mental health, um, both personally and professionally. So I have a background, uh, I've got a diploma from Canada College in uh, or mental health and addiction, and I have a Nipsey University degree in sociology. Hey guys and gals, uh, Mike Taylor from the Alliance Center in Sturgeon Falls. Uh, I work in the adult uh, addiction program there, and um, my background is a diploma in mental health and addictions. And I also have a background with a psych degree from uh, Nixon University. Uh, I've been working in the field now probably 11 or so years. Um, got a lot of specialty trainings after school uh, with um, different therapies uh, to help specifically for addiction. So um, if you're wondering what kind of therapies or what kind of uh, models uh, might work best for, for treatment, or if you had any questions about different um, treatment philosophies, uh, hopefully we can answer all of those today. I would just like to say that if there are questions that we uh, were not able to answer right on the spot, um, later on you'll have all of our contact information. And uh, if we couldn't answer it right now, we would certainly get back to you if you wanted that question answered. Also, just to add to that too, we're going to be, um, if there are some questions that we can put answers on later, we're going to put them in the comments section uh, once this video is posted up. So um, you guys will be able to get some of the answers if we skip things. Hopefully they'll be in there afterwards. Um, yeah. We can, I gotta reach over. Excuse me, guys. We're gonna jump into the questions, and this is turned off. And it's passive. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our equipment, we're just boring it. Maybe. There we go. All right. Um, so, we're gonna go through, uh, we've got a few questions already posted on here, which were uh, fantastic questions. Um, so, we're gonna go through them, maybe not so much in order by the way that they're put, but uh, we're gonna go through them anyway and try to answer all of them. Also, as we're going through, if there's comments and questions that you guys want to make, um, we'll be getting those as well. We'll be able to hopefully respond to that as well. So the first question, which was posted about a week ago, it, uh, it says, is there a difference between drugs that mellow you out versus drugs that make you feel energized or amped up in terms of addictiveness? Like, is one type more addictive than the other? Who's going first? Starts off me. Um, well, all drugs have the potential of being addictive. Um, you know, there's a, there was a, a, historically we used to think that um, drugs were about 80% physically addictive and 20% psychologically addictive. And now we know through the research that it's actually, those numbers are actually inverted. Uh, the, it's probably about 80% psychological and 20% um, physical. Um, and that's, that's uh, we can see evidence of that in that uh, most drugs, I mean, even opiates, I mean, the, the longest you're going to go through with withdrawal. And by the way, all, all three of us has, have worked at the, uh, the detox too. So we've seen people at their worst and it's kind of grassroots edu education for us. But uh, take opiates, for instance, uh, that's probably the one that you would be in withdrawal the longest. Um, but, you know, I, and other drugs, um, we have a very short um, withdrawal. But what they all do have in common is that you know, they're, they're, they're all psychologically addicting. So long after the physical withdrawal is done, um, what, what really accounts for the huge relapse rates these days is the psychological part of addiction. Yeah, and, and I mean, to add to that, it, um, not so much as far as the addictiveness goes, I know that's kind of where the question was coming from, but you gotta remember that people choose a specific drug because of the effect that it gives them, right? And, that effect is determined of where it happens in the brain, and that's going to give you the effect it gives you. So 
someone may, you know, though one drug may be, if you want to say physically, more addictive than another drug, it might not be their thing and they might never get addicted to it versus a drug that does something for them that they want, that's the effect that they're looking for, and that'll be the draw for them, right? So it's not just about uh, the physical part, like Mike is explaining, it's 20% it's that, but it's also a larger portion as far as what's the effect that they're after, what are they seeking, right, to, to be able to feel different or whatever they want to feel, right? A lot of the time, um, an addiction will kind of uh, go hand in hand with a habit, and it's kind of a habit that you develop, um, it, it becomes a routine, and depending on the substance that you're using, um, like Jimmy was saying, you're obviously using that substance, and uh, you, you use it because you like the way that it's altering your state of mind. Um, definitely, other there are some drugs between uppers and depressants that have um, more of an addictive property um, than others, but ultimately um, I think it totally depends on why you're using it um, and kind of where that impulse to use or um, how it makes you feel as opposed to how you feel sober. We, kind of, we got another question here that kind of ties into all this and, and I was gonna, I'll read it now so it, and we'll kind of answer it and it adds to this uh, topic. It says, I was wondering uh, what in the drug makes people get attached to it? Now, it's not necessarily what's in the drug that makes it, you know, the addictive part of it. It's where it has its effect in the brain. There's a reward pathway in the brain. Uh, I wish we could show you that. But if you ever look at a cross-section of a brain, it's the basically the middle part that runs from the spine to the top part of the brain. That's basically where the reward pathway runs. And it's that part, when that's triggered, that creates that addictiveness to it, right? The other thing, too, like if we're talking about opiates, Mike had brought that up earlier, is that there's parts of the brain that become... It's like they become dependent on it. Um, the, the brain will actually seek it out because it, it creates a comfort level. Uh, it avoids pain. It, it does certain things for people. So that's the stuff that they're seeking out. It's not so much what's in the drug, but where it does its thing. That's what makes it more addictive or less addictive, right? How much it affects that reward pathway. And just to add to that, um, many people have addictive behaviors that don't even have anything to do with the substance. So. The substance per se, to say like is one uh, less or more addicting, I guess uh, some drugs have more of an inherent risk involved in, in their addictive nature, but anything can be addictive. Um, there's a reason why we do anything is because we believe that it's helping us. And um, the alert of some drug use is that it, it works instantly, right? It, it does produce a desired result instantly. And what we may not realize is that although that's, that's helping us out in the short term, it might be creating other problems in the long term that are that are much more catastrophic and, and, and last or long or longer lasting to deal with. You know what? You guys covered that pretty, pretty perfectly. So. Perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> That's us. All right. Uh, next question. We have: uh, Can weed be casual, or is it always addictive? Like anything, uh, Mike brought up gambling as one. There's tons of addictions out there that we look at and. Things that my, Mike and myself, I know, have um, worked with um, that aren't just drugs. There's not sub, a substance going into a body that's creating this dependence. There's a behavior along with it, right? Every behavior serves a purpose. And if you seek out that behavior um, in an unhealthy way or it's causing problems and you still seek out that behavior, that, you know, kind of dictates if it's addictive or not. Um, to answer the question as far as can we be used occasionally or casually, I think is how to put it. Yeah, it can. There's people that do use it casually, and they don't have consequences from it. Um, there's people that use alcohol occasionally don't have consequences from it. People that gamble that don't have consequences from it. But for some people, it does become a problem, and you just need to be conscious of that because you have to weigh out that risk versus reward. And if it's going to pay off for you and you think the reward is worth the risk that you're going to take, and that's usually when people make that decision to do something. When they don't, then um, when the risk isn't worth the reward, they don't make that decision, they do the opposite, right? Um, the problem when we get into addiction, and if you ever look on um, online, you'll find, uh, look up drug use continuum, and you'll see where people move from no use right up to the dependent use, and there's that scale that people are on. When people get beyond a certain point, they oftentimes struggle with going back. You can't, you can't go back to a previous type of use. Not everybody can, some people do. Some people get beyond that and they go back and say, I can use occasionally or casually, and it's fine. Not everybody can do that. So. You have to be aware that if you move beyond that point, you might not be able to get back as easy as you think you might. And that's again has to be taken into account when you're making that decision to either use or not use. Mm -hmm. 
I think it really has a lot to do with um, it's it's on an individual basis. Um, so, you know, what may be socially for one person um, is not going to be socially for another. And uh, definitely, you know, weed is one of those things uh, that can be seen as uh, a very social, um, you know, drug that people, you know, do at any time, not just at parties or, um, you know, special occasions. It's uh, it's about getting the effect um, and... Yeah. They're seeking, they're seeking out a, it's serving a purpose for them, right? Yeah. It's filling need. It's like any other behavior, it fills a need. So if you seek out that behavior to fill that need, and you're doing it in an unhealthy way or it's causing problems and you still can't quit, look at the issue, right? It's, it's probably an issue for you at that point. Yeah, and again, it depends why you're using a particular substance, whether it's weed or not. I mean, um, if we're talking like, when, when, usually when we see people, they're they're past the, the regular uh, the social use. So we're talking more dependent, if not regular use. Um, and it, at that point, it's usually to kind of regulate emotions, right? Or to kind of regulate mood. So um, if, I, if I smoked weed once in a while and no bad things happen, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a bad goal. Historically, when you came to treatment, it was all about abstinence and you had to you know, totally abstain or you're going to hell. Uh, but treatment has changed quite a bit. It's about um, learning to modify your behavior if it is a problem or learning to kind of, um, you know, use a harm reduction approach where, um, you know, if I smoke once in a while and no bad things happen, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And if I smoke, um, you know, once a year, but every time I smoke, I get in my car and I smash my car up, well, by definition, I'm a problem user. So I, I would probably want to look at that. It, I think that the, the key thing is to watch out for the negative consequences. And like Jamie alluded to, it's a, it's a delicate scale, right? And as long, long as the, uh, the cost doesn't outweigh the benefit, then it's probably not a bad thing. Um, you want to be mindful of uh, the negative consequences, either financially, socially, physically. And if none of that stuff is being interrupted, um, you know what? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, many people drink socially. There's actually, uh, by the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, has published healthy guidelines for drinking. And I suspect someday that they'll probably publish a healthy guidelines for cannabis smoking. Um, the least amount of risk is no use at all. And then the risk goes up from there. And as far as, I mean, there are drugs that there is absolutely no social use, um, opiates being one of them. Um, any kind of substance that is actually going to have a, a physical hold on your body as well. Um, so it's not just about the, the mental um, reliance that, that you might have on it, but uh, your body is going to be craving it also. So the next question uh, kind of relates, and, and I'm trying to go through them as we're going to, just so you know, and, and match them up as we're, the topics kind of roll. So we're going to come back to cannabis questions in a bit too. Uh, but this next one, it says, why with all the facts against drugs, it doesn't make people stop using them? I don't understand why it's so easy for everyone to do drugs and why they choose to do it so often. Again, that relates back to, you know, when we were talking about addiction and moving them through that, that continuum of, they start off and serves a purpose and it does it really, really well, by the way. That's, that's the catch with drugs. If you want to avoid pain from a, a traumatic event or memories or whatever, uh, escape, uh, frustrations, anger, if you use and you pick drugs to do that, they work really, really well at that. Problem is, is that they work really, really well at that. And it becomes what you fall back to all the time as far as a release from all sorts of pressures, right? And that's where you start to see a, a substance or a dependence or, or addiction start up, is when you start to rely on that and use it in more of a fashion that's unhealthy or un, less of a social thing and more of, a, of a, an abuse type of situation. So when people um, get to the point where they're they're at that level where they're using sort of addictively, that's where they don't have the choice to stop anymore. At least they feel that they don't have it, right? And they struggle with stopping the behavior because they have nothing else to replace it at that point. Yeah. And if we're talking about mood regulation or, or regulating my mood, and in particular negative emotions, the negative emotions could be uh, boredom, it could be anxiety, it could be depression. And I adopt a strategy of using even even just wheat because apparently it's, it's uh, you know it's natural and it's supposed to be not as harmful. Although we see a lot more people even becoming, um, you know, up to psychiatric hospitals uh, because we have, can be very detrimental uh, because of the, how many times it's been hybrid and clone and potency as as opposed to the 70s. Uh, but if I if I'm using a substance to uh, avoid unpleasant emotions, 
I don't get better at, uh, at dealing with those unpleasant emotions. I actually get more sensitive to those. And what happens sometimes is if I use that, I have a saying, like if I, if I own, the only tool I have in life is a, is a hammer, uh, pretty soon everything starts to look like a nail. So if every time I'm bored, I smoke weed, or every time I'm anxious, I smoke weed. I don't actually get better at boredom or anxiety or depression or whatever uh, negative emotion I'm trying to avoid because it's an avoidance strategy. And we're not talking about social use. We're talking about regular dependent use here. I don't, I don't get better at those emotions. I actually get more sensitive to them. And then what happens later on is I start developing other problems that I didn't even have before. So maybe legal problems, financial problems, relationship problems. So not only am I not better at my original problem, now I have all these other problems that I didn't even have before. So we want to watch out for that stuff when we're talking. There's a big difference between social recreational use and regular dependent use, right? So we want to make those distinctions too. Yeah. And addiction is kind of, um, I always like to think of it as building a bridge in your mind. And like Jamie kind of says, if you're using substances, if you're having a bad day, or if you're not coping well with um, a tragedy, or you know, there's many different reasons, maybe you're just bored. There's a lot of different reasons why people pick up a substance. And if that drug allows you to go from feeling sad to happy, from bad to good, that bridge is being built piece by piece every time you use. And once you get to a certain point, I mean, people in recovery, um, basically you have to build a barricade around that bridge because that bridge doesn't really ever go away in your mind. And that's why there's people who have 20 years of sobriety and, you know, that sort of, you know, lion in the cage and that little lion will tell you, you know, you've been, you've been sober for 20 years and uh, you've been doing really well. You know what? You even deserve to use again because you've earned it. And that's how they actually end up relapsing is because that little demon never goes away. And I think by themselves, substances aren't bad. Uh, and and many, many of us use different strategies to numb. And none of those strategies are bad per se. But if I do anything too often, it tends not to work as well. And it tends to kind of start to produce negative consequences as a result, too. So, mm -hmm. anything else out of that one? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, we're going back to a, a cannabis question here. Um, if you smoke weed once in a while and no hard drugs, can your life really turn out that bad? Like, with, will all the things that they say in the media actually happen if you only smoke a couple times? Since I've heard weed isn't addicting, lose all, so for example, losing all your friends, grades dropping, etc. So basically the question is, are they asking, will that happen if you only use occasional? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it could, it, could, it might not. You know, um, that's the, the truth is... It's not necessarily so much about the amount that people use or, or uh, the frequency of that. It's about how it affects you, right? Um, the same question could be asked for any number of drugs or alcohol or, you know, pick a behavior, um, sex addiction or uh, self-harming behavior, right? Do those things by themselves create a total collapse in a person's lifestyle? If they're done occasionally, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, there are such a thing as accidental overdoses, accidental deaths from people that self-harm from cutting, for example. So those are all things that can occur, even with just one-time use. Um, pick another drug, um, ecstasy, for example. Um, there are people that are admitted to the hospital and are basically permanent residents of hospitals or mental health settings because of one-time use of a certain drug or uh, of one drug, for example. Um, it does happen with ecstasy, I can say that for sure, because I know of people that's happened to. Um, and I'm sure it can happen with other drugs as well. And I've heard of people that um, have had psychosis issues with regards to cannabis specifically, um, where their first time use of cannabis has created um, psychosis issues. So will it happen? We don't know. And I think that's pretty much the, um, the biggest risk when you're talking about it is you don't know who it's going to affect. Yeah, it, it really is. Again, it's, it's on an individual basis. So um, if you're looking, you know, uh, at yourself and you are smoking weed and you look at the circumstances under which you are smoking weed um, and you're worried that maybe that, you know, if, if you are using it to cope with something, um, you do have to be aware that there may come a time where we won't do it for you anymore. And that's where it is a gateway drug. Not for everyone, but it is for some. It is for probably 50% of the people who do smoke weed. Um, and then that's when, you know, uh, he doesn't have the effect that you want, or maybe you've allowed yourself to become such a uh, regular, you know, uh, marijuana user 
that uh, you decide to do cocaine on weekends and then before you know it you're doing it every day because you enjoy the way it feels. People don't become addicted because these things make them feel like crap. People become addicted because you know they actually enhance um, or it, it allows your brain to think that it's enhancing your life. Yeah, and if we're talking about people that have pre-existing mental health concerns, like you were saying, there's always the risk. If I smoke once in a while, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to condone any kind of drug use because I don't have to live with the consequences of that. Uh, but if I smoke once in a while, it's not likely that you would see any negative consequences because of that. Um, some of that stuff is just kind of fear-mongering. I'm, I'm sure probably everybody's uh, seen the video of Reefer Madness. I mean, that's what they kind of said. You know, you would, you would kind of go, you know, right off the deep end and you your life would never be the same. However, if you did have a, a pre-existing mental health concern or a family history of that, there's some research that says, you know, you're about 800% more likely to develop, look, we're talking about schizophrenia here. If you if you uh, have a gene and if that runs in your family, you're about 800% more likely to develop those symptoms. Uh, and those symptoms would come earlier and they would last longer and be stronger. So I've read some research that says, if you have a family history of schizophrenia, that you should avoid cannabis like it's the plague, like, like, quote, unquote, right? So those are things that you want to take into account when, when you're considering um, using any kind of drug. I mean, I think education is key in making informed decisions about the drugs that you're going to use, why you're using them, uh, what the cost is, what the benefit is. And I mean, I know it sounds like a broken record, but I mean, those are important things to consider uh, when you're going to be using uh, substances, right? Um, you know, when I was growing up and you bought drugs off the street, uh, you, you kind of knew what you were getting. Today, with this wonderful thing called capitalism, people want to maximize profits. So you're not necessarily getting what you think you're getting to, and it can have a different effect every time. Um, there are people that, that overdose uh, the first time they use. We know that we know now that trying to, to, to scare people doesn't have any effect at all. In fact, uh, I think educating people is, is the answer to it, right? So, I mean... I don't know if any of you guys ever heard about Dr. Gavin Marte, but if you ever get a chance to Google any of his stuff, he, he has uh, amazing stuff. A lot of addiction stems from trauma or neglect or, or stuff like that, uh, uh, unpleasant emotions or unpleasant life events, and, and then trying to kind of tolerate that or numb it a bit, right? Um, and one of the things he says is that uh, one of his quotes is, you know, we have to stop asking um, why the addiction and what's the pain behind it. So if you're using a substance to deal with some sort of pain or trauma, that's a whole different thing than, than, than um, social abuse, you know? And marijuana specifically, I mean, uh, there have been studies that show um, in people under the age of 18, um, the more you're smoking, the more it's actually depleting your body of its natural feel-good, um, you know, uh, serotonin and dopamine. And, you know, things that your body is naturally releasing to make you feel happy and to make you enjoy things when you are sober, um, which is kind of meaning that the more you smoke, the less you're going to be able to cope with things on your own terms. Yeah, some chronic opiate users find that, that they're left with chronic depression afterwards and that they can find no pleasure in anything because drugs does it in such a way that's so unnatural that nothing in the real world can compare to that. When we're talking about cannabis use, and even even uh, moderate to mild cannabis use, and we're talking, you know, ages uh, 12, 13, 14, right up until 25, the human brain is undergoing another huge development, right? So uh, what happens is you're, you're putting a foreign substance in there when your brain is still developing. Now, if I smoke once or twice a year, it's not likely going to have any effects. I, I couldn't say for sure because I'm not a doctor, and everybody's different, right? There's always what they call individual differences. And people are going to react to the different substances differently or have different uh, things uh, as a result. But if I start talking about regular use or even dependent use, um, I can end up being a very different version from who I was supposed to be uh, because my brain is still developing and then I have this presence of a foreign substance there on a regular basis. So those, those are things that you want to be mindful for. And what happens most often is... Um, they used to say, you know what, if you didn't have a mental illness before you, were, you had an addiction, you were probably going to have one. Well, now they've changed that to say that you absolutely will have a mental health problem after having an addiction, i.e. Uh, anxiety or depression. Now, the human brain is really good at bouncing back from stuff, but for some people, they're, they're left with long-lasting depression, perhaps for the rest of their life, or some sort of anxiety disorder, because their, their brain is being rewired, 
And I'm sure Jamie's going to add to this when it comes to the kind of the neurons in the brain and brain development. So I'll let you take it away there, Jamie, because I know you're going to you're going to add to that. Yeah. Um, so a few things. One, like Mike said, the brain's good at bouncing back to a degree. Okay, you have to understand that the brain does bounce back better the younger that you are. So if a child gets an injury or damage to the brain, because it's still developing and because it's still uh, working its way through its fi like finalizing what it's supposed to look like, it does bounce back better. As an adult, though, once you hit that 25-year-old mark, roughly, um, the brain starts to not bounce back as well because that development process is stopped and it's basically stagnant as far as what's going to be changing in the brain. Now, when we're talking about cannabis specifically, pot is um, a fat-soluble drug. Drugs can either be water-soluble or fat-soluble, which means that they dilute into water or into fat, either one or the other. They can't do both. Um, things that come out of our body rapidly, alcohol, for example, cocaine, those are water-soluble drugs. They come into our body and they come out really fast, right? They, they, you, you get rid of them out of your body rapidly, within an hour to two hours, depending like, on your dosage level. Cannabis has a long half-life. Um, it's one of the longest ones out there. It's got about a uh, 72-hour half-life. So three days, roughly, to get rid of half the drug out of your body. Or, sorry, it takes about, um, yeah, three days to get the drug out of your body. Anyway, half the drug out of your body. Um, and because it's fat-soluble, it affects cells that are fat-coated or fat-based, such as white blood cells. They're white because they're mostly made up of fat. So when you look under a microscope, that's why they're white. Um, those fight off infection. So they do affect those cells specifically. The other thing like Mike was talking about was called, it's called a myelination process. Now the front part of the brain doesn't get myelinated until you're in your late teens, early 20s. So the cells actually get coated with fat. Okay, so that if, you, if you ever look up an axon or, and, and a neuron, you'll see that there's an axon and they'll have little balls that go all the way down it. What that does is that speeds up the signal processing speed of that cell. So it will run about six times faster than what it's an unmyelinated cell will do. There's a reason why that they do this and that part of the brain uh, for some reason needs to have myelinated cells so that they run faster. That part of the brain has to do with long-term planning, it has to do with decision making, um, impulse control sort of ideas. So as that's going on and if you interrupt that process when you're um, at a younger age with something that affects the fat cells like pot which is a fat soluble drug it will actually um, have an effect on how well that that process occurs. So you might end up with a brain that doesn't have quite the, the, the myelination process completed that it should have, and you'll have cells that won't run as fast as they were supposed to run. It doesn't mean somebody's going to be slow, or it doesn't mean somebody's going to be you know, dumb or anything like that. That's not what we're saying. But that decision process that they could be doing won't work as well. Um, the long-term planning probably won't function as well. And again, people can adapt if it happens at a younger age, but if you don't interrupt that process, you're going to end up with a different person than you probably would have had you not interrupted that process. So because right, it's not normal. That that stuff is not supposed to be in our brains. That the evolution didn't program us to smoke cannabis on a regular basis. My lungs were designed to take in oxygen, not cannabis. Right. It's like being in a car accident and uh, having to go through physiotherapy to learn how to walk again. You know, you're you're learning how to do things again naturally. Yeah. Um, so we have a few more questions on the forum here. Um, Thank you. One that we'll throw to you is, um, is tobacco considered a drug even though it's legal? Hmm. Can I answer that? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I, well, I know well, for a fact. Repeat the question because you might not have heard it. So is tobacco a drug even uh, even though it's considered, or even, even though, though it's, it's legal? legal? yeah. So is tobacco a drug even though it's legal? Go ahead, Mike, take it away. Say, first of all, absolutely. And more people die from tobacco products than any other substance on the planet. So, I mean, that just speaks volumes. Um, and again, my lungs are meant to take in oxygen, not tobacco and the other, you know, 3,000 different kind of chemicals that are put into that. Uh, it's extremely addicting. Um, most people have a hard time quitting um, smoking once they start. And it's very foreign to the body. It's, I mean, it's something that's not supposed to be there. So let me just, I want to throw this out there because I thought of it when I was talking about the, the myelination process and all that stuff. Um, just so people understand, the reason why we have an effect from any specific drug, when we say like a psychotropic drug, or whatever, is because it has an effect in the brain. It has to have an effect in the brain or we don't feel anything from it. There are some drugs that go to our body and like anti-inflammatories and such that don't have anything to do really with the brain, more to do with the body. But if you're talking about something that gives you an effect, uh, alcohol, um, tobacco, nicotine, uh, you name it. All those drugs that give you a, a high or an effect, 
is because it's having an effect in your brain in some way, shape, or form. There has to be a way that it's interacting with your brain or you won't get an effect from it. So it's just, that is one big thing that I don't know that everybody is aware of when they say, you know, pot is it, or, or, or any other drug, it's, it's safe, it's, you know, alcohol is safe, it's legal, so it's not that bad, it can't be that bad. It's going to your brain, it's doing something to your brain, it has to, or it doesn't work, right? You eat, um, you eat meatballs, you're putting that into your body, it doesn't go to your brain and have an effect that makes you high, but because there's no way that it's interacting with your brain, right? That's why. Yeah. It's like coffee. Coffee is a legal drug. It, it does, it's, I mean, I use the term drug very loosely because um, it's it's not really not categorized as a drug, but there are properties in coffee that enhance your mood. It changes the dynamics of your brain and the way you will function. Caffeine is a drug. It is. Yeah. Not the coffee, but the caffeine coffee, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys have any more questions? Yeah, so another question we've got here is why is the age of first use of alcohol so critically important? And I think that could be answered for other drugs as well. The age of first use, why is that so important? Well, again, it's it's that brain development piece, right? And if you interrupt that, and again, drugs affect the brain, which we just covered. Um, if you interrupt that process of the normal development of the brain, what you're going to end up with is a much different version of your brain that you were supposed to have. Not that it will, but it could. It's like uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Um, it's where the parent, uh, typically the mother, now there is some argument that the father uses too, it can affect it as well. But when the mother's pregnant with the child, if she uses alcohol, it will affect the development of the child and permanent, basically, uh, effects to the development of the child, specifically the brain, but there are some other areas. Um, but the research that I've seen, um, there's nothing really definitive on it yet as far as to say it's for sure one-time use, but as little as one-time use can have a profound effect on what that child looks like and the child's brain development when it is at the end of the day. Yeah, depending on the field of development, too, at, at the different stages of uh, fetal development, too. Mm -hmm. I think certain experiences too, um, you know, from the time we can actually process things and learn things, we are always associating one thing with another. Um, so at a young age, if you've taken a sip of beer or you've um, enjoyed, you know, watching your parents have a good time, if you think that it uh, portrays, you know, being happy, being social, um, being popular, um, they're all going to have effects on how you perceive what you're using. And again, like just to say, you know, substances themselves aren't bad. It's how we use those substances, right? Substances have been around since the beginning of time, uh, used for ceremonies, used for many different things. So, I mean, uh, you know, me and Jamie talk about this often. Um, I can go without food for three weeks and, and before I die. Water is the very thing that I need to exist. But I can die if I drink too much water. So again, we're talking moderation here, right? So, and I think that's the key element that, that we want to talk about: moderation and knowing the risk factors uh, about what particular substance I'm, I'm going to use or how I'm going to use that. Because how I administer that drug is going to have a profound, uh, very differently profound effect on me as well. Too. And knowing those risks, um, some drugs. I, I mean, I, I don't think. Uh, cannabis is this is just my personal opinion i don't think cannabis is a gateway drug i think for the most part alcohol is probably the first drug that we're introduced to grandpa gives us a little drink of his wine or whatever so i mean that does that mean because i drank alcohol from grandpa i'm going to be raging alcoholic probably not you know um but i mean so it's just how how you're using those substances and why you're using those substances that are the biggest thing i think yeah. one of the big things to take away i mean from what we're talking about today you pick any behavior, any substance, any drug, you're going to have people at one end of the spectrum saying it's the most wonderful thing in the world, it's fine, there's nothing wrong, it's all bullshit, whatever. You have to beat that. Um, <laughs> get ready because another one is coming. Um, then you're going to have people at the other end of the spectrum saying, oh my God, it's the most horrible thing in the world, you can't, you can't do that, don't do that. The truth is somewhere in the middle with most of this stuff, right? Um, sure, there's risk factors and that's one of the things that we're talking about and there's decisions to be made as far as um, what's safe, what's not safe, that's a decision you're going to have to make. But uh, for the most part, as long as you make an educated decision, you're making the best decision you can make, right? Yeah. But it has to be educated and made based on fact, not on opinion, right? And a lot of the stuff that we're giving is opinions because that's what we have to give to you. Um, but we're giving you opinions based on 25, 30 plus years of experience doing this stuff, right? Yeah. So keep that in mind when we're talking about what we're, we're giving you for information. Yeah, if you're looking up a drug to see what the particular effect of that is or how risky it is, 
don't go on to uh, Facebook chat line. Look at a, at a research article or something that, that's kind of like a journal article or a medical article because it'll be valid and it should be pretty realistic and not somebody's, uh, you know, version of something that they thought up, right? So. And just as an extra, I think it's always really important to know your family history as well. Um, mental illness, prone to addiction, um, things like that. Not because it will necessarily mean that that happens to you, but I think it is always very important to kind of know what um, predisposed genetics you have. Absolutely. I've met people that, that reported that they instantly were addicted the very first time. They, they felt that euphoric feeling and they said, oh my God, I, I love this stuff, you know, and it didn't even have to be a particular substance. So, um, again, back to some drugs having more inherent risk than others. I mean, for some kind of drugs and the drugs we see today, the amphetamine, the methamphetamine, some of the, you know, even opiates, I mean, they have so much risk. It's almost like putting one bullet in a gun, spinning the chamber, sticking it up to your head and pulling the trigger, right? That would be insane. But Really, some drug use is, is essentially the same thing. So you, you really want to be careful about what drugs you're going to use, how you're going to use them, um, you know, um, the risk of overdose, the risk of uh, HIV, the, the risk of, you know, other infectious diseases, uh, the risk of risky behavior, um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I have a couple other questions that are kind of related, so I'll read them both off. Okay. Um, how do I know if someone close to me is addicted to drugs? or alcohol. And the second is, how can I help someone understand if he or she has a substance abuse problem? Well, do you want to just repeat the questions? In case? Yeah, yeah, if I could, I would. So how do I know if someone close to me is addicted to alcohol? So how do I know if somebody close to me is addicted to alcohol or other drugs? And how can I help someone understand if he or she has a substance abuse problem? And how can I help, how can I help someone understand if they have a substance abuse problem? Yeah. Okay. Um, Honesty is, is to me, uh, one of the most important things. Um, we, we were talking about this earlier, but each counselor has their own style on how they work, right? I'm a very straightforward type person when I'm working with somebody. Um, I lay it on the line because the next time that they go out and use could kill them. So to me, I don't pull punches. If I have to say something, I'll say it. And I think that's really, really the most effective thing to do, whether you're dealing with somebody who's using or whether you're dealing with somebody who's um, affected by somebody else's substance use. But you need to be honest with the person. So if you see a behavior, you call people on it. You say, this is what I'm seeing. And you don't do it in a judgmental way. It's not It's not a, an, act, an accusation or anything like that. It's to try to bring awareness to that person to say, here's what I'm seeing. I'm giving you the information. What you choose to do is up to you because I've done the best that I can to give you that information. But some things, um, we'll, we'll go over some things to watch out for. Um, not that all of these uh, or any one of these applies to say that this person is definitely an addict or anything. Lying, cheating, stealing, those are pretty good indicators. If somebody's doing all of those, watch out, right? Um, money, financial things, drug use, alcohol use, it costs. And the more you use and the higher levels that you use, starts to cost a lot, right? Um, so those are things to watch out for. Um, hiding things, um, changes in behavior, changes in friends, those are things that are you know, they've been saying them for years, but they are true, right? When you see somebody suddenly go from um, being really good in school and trying really hard to not really caring about things and giving up on life, giving up on things, I'm not saying that that's addiction, um, but that might be something that as an indication of that. It could be depression, it could be many different things. So calling people on their behavior really opens up that opportunity for dialogue to say, well, that's not what's going on. I'm not using drugs. I'm just, you know, I'm sad because of whatever, A, B, or C. Well, well it opens up that opportunity to be able to do that, right? So. You guys got anything else to add to that? Well, I just to add to that, like people that are uh, at that that stage of abuse, they're just not doing well in life. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, most likely, they're the last ones to figure out that they're not doing well. Everybody else around them, you know, says, "Holy geez, you're out of control," you know, uh, and they they might not figure it out yet because we have a thing called denial, and it's a, it's a part of our brain. If I'm already not feeling so good about my life, my brain is not going to allow me to see the whole picture because I probably have a meltdown. So people become in denial about their behavior or what's going on around them. And it's not that they're deliberately trying to, to do that. By the way, I've never met anybody that came into my office and said, when I grew up, I want to be a drug addict and screw over my family and wreck my, you know, steal from my grandmother. It's not a choice. It's not about willpower. If it was about willpower, I wouldn't even have a freaking job, right? Yeah. And so, it, I mean, many people stopped having fun a long time ago, but they can't seem to stop that behavior because it comes, it becomes so hardwired in the brain and that the bridge that Ashley was talking about 
becomes so easy to go across. And because it's my one catch-all, fix-all thing for dealing with everything in life, it tends to be, you know, take, it preoccupies everything in my life. And people tend, to, if they seem to be preoccupied with, with um, you know, with a particular behavior or a particular, even they're just gone. They're not emotionally available. They're just not there anymore. You know, they're not present, right? When you, those are all signs and symptoms that's, that something's going on. Yeah, I, you know what, I don't have anything to add. I think uh, Jamie and Mike did a great job of things to look for. Um, they covered pretty much everything. Um, so it's just important to remember to always try and come from a place of um, concern and compassion. You guys aren't the experts. Um, you really are going to be there just to help support them. And like Jamie said, honesty really is the best policy. Um, you are fully capable of being able to um, hopefully do that um, without coming from a place of judgment um, and just, you know, really highlighting, you know, this is what I've been seeing. This is kind of um, where I, I think this is going. This is maybe how I feel. Um, and unfortunately, doing anything less than that is a, even a little bit of form of enabling. Um, turning a blind eye um, is kind of one of the worst things that you could do. I mean, there are worse, um, but definitely... You know, uh, if, if they're not willing to hear it at one time, maybe bring it up at a different time. Um, but at least let them know that you, this is something that you are continuously seeing um, and that it's not something that you're going to ignore. I, can, I could literally go on for hours about significant other stuff. But that's, and again, it's an area that I do a lot of work in, uh, the people that I see. I see a lot of people in that. Just to add to that and just to kind of keep... This is what I tell parents when they call me. And I have, I have quite a few times parents will call me and say, my son's doing this, my daughter's doing this, what do I do? Have you called the cops? Have they stole from me? No. Well, why not? I don't want to get them in trouble. Okay, well, when we talk about enabling, this is a behavior that if they continue to do it, will kill them in one way, shape, or form eventually. Right? If it becomes an addiction and that's what happens, it will kill them. So basically what you're doing is you're enabling your child to kill themselves. And I tell parents that straight out. And it might seem like a stretch to some people, but the reality is that's what's going to happen. I mean, if it becomes an addiction and that addiction is left untreated, it will kill the person. That's the definition of a disease, right? It has to have symptoms. It has to be progressive. And if it's not treated, it's fatal. And uh, the addiction qualifies as a disease. Therefore, I'm not far-fetched in saying that. It might be years down the road. But that's how severe and how significant a person's choice and behaviors when it comes to working with an addict is so important. And to not enable is is probably the most important thing, right? So, and if I could just add to that, every drug has a, a faster or slower progression as, as you get into addiction. Um, cannabis and alcohol, you could probably be very functional for many years. Uh, there's a lot of very famous, prominent people in our communities that have uh, problems with alcohol. And if you drive by their house, you might not see that. I would believe they, they look very functional and they can be very functional for years. Um, drugs like methamphetamine, crystal meth, uh, even opiate use, you'll you'll see a, a really faster progression with the with the addiction, right? So um, every uh, just because um, you don't overtly see or openly see a whole bunch of negative consequences, doesn't mean that there's still uh, subtle dysfunction. You know, you drive by the house, it looks it looks beautiful inside, but there's a lot of disconnect there. There's a lot of uh, hurt or pain, or there's a lot of needs that aren't being met in the house. Um, there's a lot of disconnect. If I'm, uh, you know, just to give an example, uh, if I'm bonding with my children and I'm in an altered state of consciousness, even if it's cannabis, I'm interrupting a natural process of bonding with my children. That, that's not natural, you know. Um, there's going to be consequences for that. Um, it's not a natural form of development, and that's interrupted. Any time spent on unhealthy behavior is just time taken away from what could be healthy behavior. Mm -hmm. And time is the most important commodity that we have. We, we can get more cars, we can make more money, we can buy more food, uh, we can get more water, but we can't get more time. It's one thing we can't get more of. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we even have terms for getting rid of it. I'm killing time, wasting time, pissing time away. We have all these terms for the one thing that we can't get more of, the one thing we can't get more of. So again, like she said, it's, it's very important to use that time wisely. I have a, a question here that I want to answer because <laughs> It's a fantastic question. Um, they're all fantastic. They're all fantastic, they but I, I really like this question. And there's no such thing I, as a silly question. To I'm, I'm going to sound weird saying that once you hear the question. But the question is, can smoking weed affect erections? Absolutely. <laughs> can it affect erections? Yes. Okay. 
So, okay, you want the answer? Yes, it can. And here's why it can, okay? Remember how I said earlier, uh, cannabis is a fat-soluble drug, right? Well, the brain and the white blood cells are not the only areas that have fat cells in them. One area, another area that has a super large amount of fat of white blood cells or, or of fatty coated cells is reproductive organs. And for men, you can actually smoke enough weed to reduce the amount of testosterone that a person has to the point where they basically develop breasts, like a woman has. So, interesting. It can get to the point where they can even lactate from those breasts. So that's how significant that cannabis can, I'm not saying it does for everybody, but can have that impact on a person if they smoke enough of it. So just be aware, so to answer the question as far as can it affect your erections, absolutely, because it can affect the testosterone levels. And we, we get approached all the time. Me and Jamie do a lot of presentations in the community and in the schools, and we get this all the time where people say to us, you know what, everybody smokes weed, <laughs> right? Yeah. And no, not everybody smokes weed, and we can show you some stats that uh, across Canada, uh, that not I agree, uh, about 11% of the people across Canada smoke. Uh, uh, that was an Ontario stat. Okay, yeah. Ontario stat. 11%. But it's, it's not too far of a leap to say that that would be the same across. I mean, different provinces would be different, obviously. But it's not too far of a leap to say that not everybody smokes weed. Maybe in a small northern community, maybe all you see is your friends doing that. But, but in fact, if you look statistically, not everybody does that behavior. And, you know, talking about a small northern community, we said it before, Mike and I both work out of Sturgeon Falls, which I think the greater Sturgeon area, <laughs> you can call it that, but um, <laughs> has about 3,400 people population-wise, something, something like that. So it's a small northern community, that's what we are. Um, the health unit here in North Bay, which also um, covers West Nipissing area, Perry Sound, North Bay, Nipissing District, um, they did an oversampling of the students uh, once the Ontario Student Drug Use Survey came up from CAMH, which is the Ontario one Mike was talking about. When that came out, they did an oversampling population, so they sampled all the students from West Nipissi in the high schools to see if the numbers matched up for small northern communities to what the student survey was showing for across Ontario. And the numbers were almost identical. There was no statistical difference between northern communities and the rest of Ontario. So comparable-wise, the numbers show the same, and I can't remember what they are. If you want to look, find out, um, I can tell you that if you go on camh.net and look up Ontario Student Drug Use Survey, it's O-S-D-U-S, -S, um, you will find the 2013 one is out now. You will find those stats in there, and I can tell you that the Sturgeon Falls stats match up almost identical to what the uh, 2000, I'm sure it was the 13, it was either the 11 or the 13 stats that they compared them to, and they're almost identical. So. Yeah, and it, it, on the same website, I'm, I'm certain they'll still be posted that you can find the stats for cocaine use, you can find all, the stats for alcohol use. But all the stats are there, yeah, they're, they're yeah. All, all, for all the drugs are there, and it shows the trends, it shows which drugs are being used more, and it divides into grades. Yeah. All that stuff is displayed there. And it was funny because when we talked about that, the, the students said, oh, that's for older people, that's not for students. And we find that the, the stats are very similar, right across the board for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. so. You want to pick another one or you want us to? Yeah, sure. We've got a question here. Um, what are some tips for people who are trying to quit smoking on their own? If you have any? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we're talking cigarettes or other stuff. Um, if you have any, uh, maybe Tips in general. we could start with cigarettes and if you have... I can, I can speak to that. There's there's a lot of different, um, we have a lot of, even in addiction in general, we have a lot of new tools that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. Um, the research says that if I quit smoking and I just use the patch or some medicated assisted recovery, I have about 30% chance of being successful. If I just use education and, and um, quit smoking, the research says I'll have about 30% success quitting smoking. If we're talking about cigarettes. And I, I, you know what, addiction is addiction is addiction. It's not the, the particular substance, it's the behavior really. And so it's not too far of a leap to say that the, the research could be very similar for a lot of different substances. But they say if we combine those two, those two philosophies, the education part and the medicated assisted part, whether it's the patch, the gum, or you know, whatever other um, things that they have available, that my odds go up to about 60% for being successful at, at achieving my goal of quitting smoking. That's why, and, and best practices show that for mental health as well to be the case, not just, excuse me, not just for therapy and not just for the, the psychiatry piece, but to mix the both is where you have your highest um, chances of success rates. So it's, it's comparable not just for addictions, but for mental health as well. It's always a good idea to try and find what motivates you also. What are the reasons why you'd like to quit smoking? You know, writing down, trying to look at them every day, um, reinforce that feeling of, you know, why you want to be able to quit. Um, 
Uh, well, here's one. Um, we talked a little bit about pregnancy earlier. Is there a minimum limit you can use of anything, drugs, alcohol, or smokes, if you are pregnant? Um, my professional recommendation to that uh, would be the minimum or the maximum that I would suggest you use is zero um, when you're pregnant. And the risk goes up from there. And the risk goes up from there. Um, like I said before, and I don't know if they caught this part of the video, but um, there's still some research that's showing that we're not 100% sure, but even one-time use can have such a profound effect on, on the fetus as it's developing, right? So uh, even if one-time use is, is really too much, and um, there is some people that are looking into it, there's some research being done with regards to alcohol, whether the male, the man who's contributing um, to that child development, procreation, <laughs> The other half. Anyway, if they drink during that process, if, if it has an effect as well on the fetus. So it can be to that extent that um, even one time use on the father's side, when that's occurring, can have an effect as well. But again, there's no research to definitively show that. But as far as a professional recommendation, is zero during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and because everybody is different, it can have a different effect as far as, far as alcohol and mom drinking. And we're not really sure, 100% sure when that development, when that fetal development is affected the most, because there's a, a, a Greek term, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, but it's called pterogen. And really what, what it means is monster, right? A dog and so <laughs> we're talking about alcohol being a monster to, to the fetus, right? And that, it could happen at any part of the pregnancy. They're not 100% they're not sure uh, when that will happen to the fetus. Does it always happen? I don't think so, but the possibility is there. Uh, just like the, you know the earlier question, will uh, will those bad things happen to me if I if I uh, smoke cannabis or if I drink at a very young age? Um, not uh, not when we're talking about once in a while use. Not likely. Is it possible? Absolutely. Um, now here's a question that's tied into that one: Can a person be too young to become addicted to alcohol or drugs? Uh, we see people that are, um, or children that are born addicted to substances, whether they have a dependency on it. So when they, they're born, they go through withdrawals from that drug. So it shows a dependency. Um, I haven't seen any studies lately that show any kind of uh, long longitudinal study to say, these children that are born that way, do they be, are they more uh, likely to develop addictions later on in life? My assumption would be that they'd be predisposed to that. So any drug use would probably have a, a higher likelihood of becoming a, a problem for them, but again, I don't have data to say that specifically. Yeah, I, I've read some research that says, you know what, if you don't have an addiction problem by the time you're 25, you're not likely going to, but again, there's always those people out that, what they call outliers on the out, uh, outer ends of the, that research that, I mean, people can develop addiction later on in life, absolutely. Most likely if you don't, uh, what, what suggests that people become addicted or develop those behaviors, you know, in their teens, right? Uh, because, like I said, if you don't become addicted to a particular substance by the time you're, you're 25, and really addiction uh, these days, we know more and more that it's not necessarily about a substance. Addiction can be about a particular behavior, too, that has nothing to do with uh, substances. But if that's not going to happen by the time you're 25, it's not likely going to happen. Yeah, but it's not the rule, though. Um, again, it's an individual basis. Um, so um, I think... The earlier you're going to start with these um, behaviors and these habits, um, the, the harder it is going to be um, to be able to kind of get back onto the healthier way of uh, coping naturally the way you need to. There's a, the, um, can you give me that question? Okay. I have another question here, and, and um, it had to be clarified. I guess some people were unclear, and I was unclear on the question too, but. Um, one person's asking about the stuff that people use for hiding um, things in, like fake pop cans, weed, um, like for hiding weed in, hats, uh, lighters. Do cops check that stuff? I, we're not, neither, none of us are police officers that I know of. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but the, um, I can tell you from talking to officers that they do check, and they know actually a lot more than we think that they know, and they look for things in a lot um They've seen it all, right? They, they, they've been down that road. Um, where do they check for weapons, things like that? I never even would have thought of, and, and I thought it was pretty clever, but I would have never thought to put things in the places that they were talking about. I'm not going to win and wear. It's not Judy. But, um, can you mind the other officer? Yeah. But anyway, um, the, um, 
the answer to that is I would I would suspect that they do. And there's some indicators um, and things that they watch out for and things because we have a display at the Alliance Center that shows a lot of that stuff for parents to, to become aware because we always had questions about that. Where do kids hide it? How do they hide it? How do they get it past us? Because they still are and we don't know how. So we do have a display that we show people. Um, and they do, we have the hat, we have uh, like Red Bull can, pop can, <coughs> things like that, that we... Um, things that you would think you would hide in. So yeah, but you guys, you guys know that stuff yeah. too. It's not like we're telling yeah. stuff you don't already know. But, but to answer your question as far as where the police look, yeah, they're going to look. Yeah. I, and if you get away with it, it's just dumb luck, I, I would say, that you got away with it. I mean, there's a lot of, you can even buy that stuff now. You can buy the, the Red Bull, it. yeah, the Red Bull cans that you screw off or um, any other kind of decoys. But uh, anytime, especially if it's in a car, you could just be stopped on the side of the road. Um, if a police, police officer feels as if that they have um, a reason, if they suspect whether you're high, if they can smell it, anything like that, um, they have every right to be able to search every inch of you and your property. So I think we are going to wrap it up. Did you guys have any last words that you wanted to add just to sort of wrap it up or share any final thoughts with our audiences? Mm -hmm. um, for me, if, if anybody has any further questions, our, our information, our contact info is going to be posted. We definitely would, um, I, I myself, I can't speak for else, but I would love to have people contact me and ask me more questions. Um, hopefully this shows, you know, that we are approachable, that we're open to pretty much any question. Um, there are some things that we probably can't answer if it's too technical with regards to um, specific substances and chemical, um, chemical stuff. Like, like we're not we're not doctors by any means and we don't do any kind of um, research in that regard. So it's hard for us to answer some of those questions. You have to understand that we deal with primarily the people, the behaviors, the actions, the feelings that they're going through. Those are the things that we deal with primarily. Um, along with that comes, you know, the addiction piece, and we need to understand about that and know about that. But um, by all means, we, we, we definitely are. I definitely want people to call me with more questions. We're hoping that this isn't the only time that we're going to be doing this um, this type of ask a question sort of situation. Um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to do more of these. But uh, for now, if, if you do have any questions, all our information is going to be posted for you guys to have access to. So. Mm -hmm. Never stop asking questions. That would be the best thing that I can leave you guys with. Um, there are no stupid questions. And, um, you know, especially working in the field, I don't think any of us are naive to the fact that, um, you know, total abstinence is probably a lot to ask of, uh, you know, people who are growing up and wanting to experience new things. Um, but it's always best to arm yourself with as much information as possible. Um, so that you, you can make those kind of educated decisions on, uh, on how you're spending your time. Yeah, and I, th I think the biggest thing is to ask yourself, are bad things happening because of my substance use? Are negative things happening? And if no bad things or negative things are happening, and, and be careful not to minimize that, right? Um, then, then it's probably not such a bad thing that, you know, whatever you're, whatever substance you're doing, although some, some drugs have great risk and some have uh, little or no risk at all, right? Um, when we talk about the healthy guidelines for drinking, um, and, and that's for people that over 45 years old, by the way. You know how people say, well, you have a couple of drinks and you'll be fine. You don't really get those benefits until you're after 45 years old because when you're 25 years old, you're in the best shape of your life anyways. You're, you're never going to be, you know, trust me, I can, <laughs> it's all downhill for us from here. So, yeah. so um, but the guidelines say if I stick to those guidelines that I'm probably going to get benefits from it because the reality is there are pros and cons about drug use. And as long as the pros outweigh the cons, it's probably not a bad thing. So don't do drugs. No, <laughs> Probably have to edit that one out. Yeah. We gotta get out of the way. Oh, we're moving. Back. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Oh, we're just back. Okay. okay, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We apologize for the technical issues. We're definitely gonna look into that to make sure it works perfectly next time. Be sure to visit PlanetNorth.ca. Get on the forum, and we'll be posting the contact information for our lovely experts that we had tonight. And we'll also have a poll. So you can vote and see which expert you'd like to chat to on our next ASCA event. Thank you so much and have a good night, guys.